Hello there, Facebookers. Hello, YouTubers. Good evening. Welcome to Live Irish Myths. This is episode 118. I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. Tonight's topic is, well, for the day that's in it, why not? Island of the Setting Sun, an epic journey into Ireland's mythic and monumental past. Hope you're all keeping safe and well. Long time no see. And hope everybody's safe and sound with everything that is going on in the world, pandemic related and not and otherwise. The evenings are really um, uh, yeah, closing in on us here. It's actually, it's not dark yet, but it's nearly dark. So we're back to that part of the year when, um, you know, at this time of the evening, it's uh, it's dark. And so the winter lies ahead of us. And uh, the next time we'll see light during Live Irish Mits is probably next March, probably April of uh, next year, if we see it. <laughs> Let's hope we do. Anyway, good evening, everybody. A quick hello to everybody who's on YouTube. Daisy Peters is the first of the commenters on YouTube. Daisy, I have to give a special mention to, is one of the most enthusiastic of the Mythical Ireland YouTube followers, always comments on every video, even if it's not about Mythical Ireland, even if it's about ham, ham radio or brass banding. Uh, so Daisy, delighted to see you. Um, a very blessed Monday, she says. Well, the same right back at you. Erica Bow is saying good afternoon. Hello, Erica. Hope you are safe and well. Deborah Williams says, hello, everyone from Hillsborough, Maryland. Here's hoping you are well and happy. Well, all good so far, Deborah. So let's keep the fingers crossed. Carl Deegan says, Jiri Vanton August Ullig on Aha Clea. Love this topic. Brilliant stuff, Carl. And uh, glad to see you from Dublin, where uh, Dublin, as you many of you will know, is the capital city of Ireland. Uh, but the county of Dublin is locked down at the moment. Severe restrictions due to COVID. So we're having flare ups again and the numbers are rising again. So we're trying to keep them down. So let's all do our best. Archaeoastronomy database says, Hello, one and all. What a lovely autumn day it is, yeah. I would have loved to have been out with the camera, but I was too busy doing other things. Um, it, it was a gorgeous sunset. It looked like a really nice one. And the moon uh, is waxing gibbous. It is almost full. A couple of days, I think, tomorrow or the next day, we'll see some very nice moon rises if it's clear. Mandy McCurl says, Phew, running a bit late. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm delighted to have you, Mandy. Uh, good evening to you. Mez Marion says, Hello, Anthony and everyone. Blessings for us all. Yes, indeed. And uh, blessings and all the rest to you, uh, Marion. I hope you're in good form. Janet Moran says, hi, Anthony and the two are from Boston. Always delighted to see the Bostonians in the house. The full Irish GK says, Tronoa, good evening from Tala in South Dublin. That's to everyone. Yes, indeed. And good evening right back to you, to Tala Muncha Partalon. John Main says, hello, everyone. Greetings from a warm San Francisco. Brilliant, uh, John. And the season is hotting up for you as it's cooling down for us. So um, so long as you're not too smoked out by fires there, I hope everybody's safe in California. Sandrine Brady says, Bonsoir, Anthony and Tua. This time, summer has gone for good. Windy and rainy, but a warm evening, thanks to our weekly show. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Bonsoir, Sandrine. Hope you're well. Stephen Walker says, Greetings, everyone, and congratulations, Anthony. Thanks, Stephen. Another, another milestone reached. Another publication. Uh, lands in my hands in printed form. Deborah Williams says, so sorry, just got back. Forgot I had to put a pan of bread pudding in. I hope I didn't miss anything. <laughs> Shoo, she didn't miss anything. Just a few hellos, Deborah. And on you, uh, Facebook even, Barbara Barney gets the honour tonight of the first comment on Facebook. It also says top fan. So, Barbara, thank you. Welcome along. Top fan also is L.M. Moore, who says greetings to all. Falcha, I wonder you related to Richard. Patricia Langton, my co-author. You get plenty of mentions tonight. Patricia Langton says, hi, Anthony Murphy. Hello, Patricia. How are you keeping? Good to see you. Sandra Boothroyd says, good evening, sir. Good evening also to you, madam. Hello, Sandra. Alex Casterton says, evening, Anthony Antua. Nights are drawing in. Yes, indeed they are. And it's I have the little fan heater out for the first time in months and months and months. And it's just on a setting where just every few minutes it just pumps a little bit of hot air into the room. And you might hear it in the background, but please just don't let it distract you. Rex Fortenbury says, Greetings, Anthony and the Tua from Stormy, Louisiana. 
well, hopefully we won't have any storms over here, but um, stay safe, Rex. Rowan Grove is saying hello all from Colorado. Hello, Rowan. Welcome back. Susan Scott says hello. Happy to be here with all of you. And well, sure, we're also happy to have you here, Susan. Brilliant stuff. Adina Sparks says afternoon, Anthony, and our wonderful Tuha. Hope everyone is staying well. So far, so good. Eva Anderson. Hi, Anthony. Perfect timing with online Wiccan discussion. I was taking part in just ended. I was so sad that I was going to miss today's live. Brilliant timing indeed, Eva. Welcome along. Christina Zaba says, hello, Anthony Fulcher. Christina, long time no see. I hope you are well. Laura McCormick says, evening to all from the west of the island of the setting sun. The last ones to see the sun going down uh, before uh, you get to America across the ocean. Patricia O'Mara is in Tennessee and says, hello, hello, Patricia. Jackie says, hello. Yes, indeed. A nice, enthusiastic hello with a smiley emoji straight back at you. <laughs> What's he at? <laughs> Carol Swain Stedronsky says, hi, from California. Hello, Carol. Carol, you're very welcome along. Nick Eska Casterton says, hi, Anthony. Great seeing all the excitement about your great book. Hi, Tua. Hope you're all safe and all okay. All in good form, Nick. Uh, delighted to see you again. Melanie Lynn is in the house. Hello, Anthony and the Tua. Volge, Melanie. How are you keeping? Nancy Sterling says, hello, Anthony from Vermont. Hello, Nancy. Welcome the Vermontians into the house. I have undoubtedly got that wrong. Somebody from Vermont, uh, perhaps uh, you might tell me, Nancy, uh, how do you describe somebody who is from Vermont? In Drogheda, we say we are Drahedians. Maria Rodriguez Doyle says, hello, love from Spain, grow more earth uh, from all of us. Maria, good evening to you. Barbara Kling says, hello, Anthony. Sorry I cannot join the live because I'm in Irish class right now. A tremendously brilliant excuse not to be watching live Irish myths. We'll catch up later. Can't wait to receive my copy of Island of the Setting Sun. Brilliant stuff. Hope you really enjoy it. Brendan Byrne says, time to put the fire on and maybe a wee dram. The wee dram is very tempting, Brendan, I'll tell you. Desiree Riley is along. Says, hello, Anthony and Thua from Stormy, Louisiana. Stay safe. Stay safe, Desiree. Ralph Waldron says, good evening to all the Tua. Fault you, Ralph. Rogue Vulcan says, hey, hey, Jirich, Rogue Vulcan. Joe Butler says, hello, Tua. Greetings from a much cooler Colorado, but still smoky. And thank you, Joe, uh, for your communication. Uh, uh, delighted to uh, make your acquaintance. Catherine Cooney says, glad to see you again, folks from central New York. Great delight for us to have you along, Catherine. Fault you. Paula Snow Queen is giving the wavy hand. Hello, Paula. Keith Swift says, good afternoon from Florida. Fault you, Keith. Yvette Tillema says, hi, Anthony and Tua. It's peak colours in the Adirondacks. Uh, yeah, I can imagine that's nice. It'd be a nice place to have the camera now, wouldn't it? Slaunch you. Anyway, Kelly Edmiston is in the house. I'm ready for my bedtime story now, Professor. <laughs> Whereabouts in the world are you right now, Kelly? You're obviously not in the States because you're not. It's definitely not bedtime in the States unless you you never know. You could sleep in the middle of the day. If you're like me, you need 40 winks every so often. Is it Eli or Ellie? Ellie, Eli Redabau says, finally chilly here in Colorado on the plains. Yes, we're heading for the fall, aren't we? And I, by that, I mean autumn, not any other kind of fall, I hope. And McCallum is in the house, another very enthusiastic supporter. And it's a delight to have you along. Says, hello, Anthony and the Mighty Tua. I'm delighted to announce that my very own signed copy of The Cry of the Sebuk was sitting in my mailbox when I arrived home today. Woohoo! Yay! Brilliant. I hope you really enjoy that. And I'm sure you will. Matthew Bessel says, back from New Hampshire, awesome leaf display. Slauncha Tua from Gay Kelsk. Good evening to you, Matthew. Welcome along. Jules Cousins is waving. Giorgich, Jules. Alan Taff says, hello from his hospital bed in Lyon. Love your program. Keep it going. Hello, Alan. Hope nothing too serious and get well soon. Peter Kennedy says, good evening to all from Balia Brigine. And that's Igunde Achlia. Just made a big mug of rooibos ru tea to warm myself up in anticipation for this evening's episode. Well, I don't know what it is, but I hope it's nice and it sounds good. Tom King is watching. Falls you, Tom. Alwyn Roy Badziak is also in the house. Good evening, Anthony and everyone. Dark and chilly in Berkshire. Yeah, copy and paste. Definitely the same here. Porogo Komiski is along. Says hello, Anthony. Amazing day at Loch Crew yesterday. Amazing views towards Schlievgullion and the Cooley Mountains. 
Brilliant stuff, Power. Great to see you. Uh, Flacco Castez says, I like your whiskey and your country. In that order. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm delighted that our whiskey is. Uh, where is Richard Kelly wants to know? Well, I mean, for, you know, social distancing and all that, um, we're on opposite ends. I'll see if I can get him to join us because uh, it'd be lovely to have him here, you know. Mariana Dunn says, greetings and blessings to Anthony and Artua from Virginia. Hello, Mariana. Falls, you welcome along. Uh, Shirley Sheila says, hello from Israel. I'm not sure if we've had anybody viewing from Israel before. So, Shirley, it's delight. It's our great delight to have you along, Falcha, and welcome to Live Irish Mits. Larissa Kama says, greetings to and Anthony from sunny Oregon. Congratulations on the release of your book. And so good to see everyone today. Yes, indeed, Larissa. And it's lovely to see you also. Melanie Corpy is back in the house. Says hello from Georgia in the USA. Hello, Melanie. Uh, I, apologies about the pronunciation. Milagros Ibiricu Iglesias says hello from Spain. Brilliant. Hello, Falcha. Good evening. Trenonawa. Doris O'Hara says hi, Anthony, and everyone. Geoglitch, Doris. Tom King says, oh, there's a nip in the air this evening. There certainly is, Tom. Good evening, Anthony, and all the lovely two. Uh, hope all in good form. All good, Tom. No doubt when you have the four, John, gives you that little bit of warmth out in the cold. Donna Firer says, hello, everyone from Maryland. Glad to be here with all of you. And we're very glad to have you along, Donna. Uh, is it Giada Claire says, good evening to all. Trenonawa, Colleen K. Dote, D O D T, says hello from Michigan. Hello, Colleen. Falcha. Laura Puente is in Chicago. Excited to watch at, or at slash hear today's episode. Waiting for my copy. Brilliant stuff, Laura. Now, a little bit of a, uh, an update on that momentarily once I finish the hellos. Nancy Witchley says hello from New York. Giagich, Nancy. Nancy Sterling says we call ourselves Vermonters. Not Vermontonians or anything like that. Vermonters, yes. That's fairly straightforward, isn't it? Neil Hughes says, To Nona from Coatbridge, Scotland, Neil and Mary, all set. Your first book has led us on a wonderful journey and to meet wonderful friends in Drogheda. Hope to get back soon. Tea, August Fian at the ready. Tea and wine. <laughs> Tea for Mary and wine for Neil. Not a mixture for both. Tea and wine could be an interesting combination. Kristen Murray Endre says, no remote school today. So I can join you all. Greetings, Anthony. And the two are brilliant stuff, Kristen. Welcome along. It's brilliant to see you. Charlene Henderson says, good luck. Thank you, Charlene. Colleen, after 35 trips to Ireland, I never tire of the stories. Wow. 35 trips. Fantastic stuff. Charlene uh, says, I hope all is well. All good so far. Charlene Henderson said, blessed be from Salem in Massachusetts. Fulgit. Charlene, welcome along. Theresa McGuinness says, just a breath of cooler here, cooler air here in Callahan, Florida last week, just for a day or two. Paul Garron says, good evening, Anthony, Richard and Tua. Looking forward to this. And thank you again for public book copy number one. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. We will explain that too momentarily. Um, Brady Tussey says, hello from Arizona, can't wait for today's episode. Glad to be here, Anthony. Hope your day has been a good one so far. Well, it's been a busy one, but uh, yeah, can't complain too loudly. Rui Bus or Red Bush. Okay, yeah, I have it. Red Bush. Okay, I didn't know that that was another name for it. Samantha Healy says, Good evening, all. Fulcher, Samantha. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter says, Yay, Texas in the house with Anthony again. Fulcher, Goji Chachwarku, August as usual, you know. Pull yourself up a big chair. <laughs> uh, uh, Richard is messaging me here. I'm going to tell him to, to join us. Sorry. Um, Tony Stone says hello from Surrey in England. Hello, Tony Falcha. Vicky Wallace Southerl is in the house. Says hello, my lovely friends. Hello, Vicky. And hello to Evan. And also to, is it Ian? And also to Chile. Hello. Good evening. Hello to you all. Hope you're safe and well. Kim Taylor says Jigic from Atlanta. Falcha. Kim, lovely to see you along. Mary Ann Carey says hi from Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. Falcha, Mary. Not too long 
Well, it'll be a year soon enough since I was in New Jersey, but there you go. Nola Snyder says, greetings all from Massachusetts. Just came from the post, sent my Irish passport application again. The Fay fooled with pictures, I think. <laughs> Darren Greenidge says, hello, Anthony, from a very deserted Edinburgh. You're looking very spiky today. Looking forward to this tonight. Spiky. What does that mean? I hope that's I hope that's spiky in a good way and not spiky as in... Argh. Um. Brendan Byrne says, this must be the most socially dis distanced, friendly, good-mannered group on the planet. <laughs> Very nice uh, thought that perhaps it is. Yeah, lovely. Uh, Nolan Proctor says, Trinonua a Anton August Tua Falche Nolan Tarini Pendleton says, Banachti all August Banacht Ort Fein. Emer Galvin says, hello all from Yorkshire. Can't wait to get the book. Sitting in the garden by candlelight with a glass of wine, waiting for the story to unfold. Brilliant. Richard is here. Brilliant stuff. Thank you, Richard. Brilliant to see you along. Of course, it's uh, important that people are able to interact with you, given that you're a big part of this story, which is brilliant. Colleen says, my Tura was my favourite to study. Even made it to Inish Murray. Brilliant stuff. Fantastic. Judy McQueen says, hello, Judy. Good evening. So what is that now? Let me uh, find my pen. Ooh, where did I put my pen? I may have put it back. I shouldn't have, but I did. What is that now? That's uh, Let's call that 16 and a half minutes. So um, interestingly, uh, a lot of names were coming up there, and I recognized them uh, from being regular viewers and all that. Um, Danilo Paparello says, hello, Anthony, from Italy. Ciao. Ciao, Danilo. Falce. Um, and one of the reasons that the names, some of them are immediately familiar is because I, I saw your names on the address labels. So a quick update in terms of exactly where we are with Island of the Setting Sun 2020 edition. All of the copies that are going to people in Ireland were sent in today's post. All of the copies that are going to Northern Ireland... Uh, any part of mainland Britain, that is Scotland, Wales, or England, and any that are going to mainland Europe are also in today's post. Now, I'm hoping that some of the Irish recipients will get theirs tomorrow. I can't guarantee that. You should get them in the next couple of days. Perhaps those of you who are in uh, Britain and further afield, and Ireland, of course, when you get your book, you might take a picture with it and share it to the Mythical Ireland community on Facebook. Uh, that'd be, a, I think, just a, a nice thing to do. I'll just put the link to that in there just in case you haven't, if you're on Facebook and you haven't uh, joined the Mythical Ireland community, um, I'll, uh, I'll paste that in there now. Um, those of you who are in Australia, I did bring the books to the post office today but I was told they won't be posted till tomorrow because the Australian, the the restriction on the Australian post from Ireland is finally being lifted tomorrow after months of not being able to send uh, books to Australia. And those of you who are in Canada today's uh, were also sent today. The United States viewers, I'm going to post yours tomorrow. Look, there's a very good reason they weren't all posted together, and that's simply because it would take too much time. Um, I have a batch of books to bring to the post office in the morning. The ones for the United States take a lot longer because apparently there's restrictions uh, over everything now. Even though we would write address labels on all of the books to go to America, they have to be retyped in at the post office, every one of them. So it's a time-consuming process. But... Tomorrow's will all be uh, to, for the States. So if you're in the States, your book will hopefully leave. Well, it'll certainly be collected from the post office in Drogheda tomorrow uh, once we get them all delivered to the post office in the morning. And at that point, as of tomorrow evening, I'd probably try to do that in the morning sometime. As of tomorrow evening, every order that has been made through the website will have been fulfilled. Um, so hopefully you'll all be excited. I see Patricia Langton commenting there. So Patricia, uh, Tom King uh, was another one. Um, you'll, you, you, you will hopefully get your books tomorrow. If you don't get them tomorrow, hopefully you'll get them the next day. Um, I wanted to mention, he's already mentioned it, that um, the very first copy 
Um, so I would think I was explaining that when books are printed, normally what the printer does is sends a couple of copies hot off the press by post, by um, express post. And so two copies arrived at Liffey Press last week. I, I picked up one of those and became the first person, uh, apart from the publisher, uh, to have a copy. And I even signed it. And I always do this with my first copies. Uh, Anthony Murphy, first copy, 18th of September 2020. It's actually 10 days ago now. Um, and so the second of uh, the next person to actually receive a copy was Richard Moore, my co-author, who is here with us on the feed. And everything else was in envelopes ready to go. And it just so happens that Paul Gowron, uh, who doesn't live too far away from me, was in the vicinity and he called and collected his. So Paul Gowron has the honour of becoming the first non-author uh, or non-publisher to have a copy of the 2020 edition of Island of the Setting Sun. Um, so uh, I don't know who the second will be, but uh, I'm sure uh, perhaps in the morning if some of you receive your copies, you might take a picture and share uh, and share with us. Uh, share your joy. <laughs> um, hopefully, hopefully it'll be joy. Um, so, you know, as if all of this wasn't enough, because there's loads of stuff going on. The next thing, of course, is the 2021 calendar. Uh, I will be organizing in the next 24 to 48 hours. I will put up a pre-order page on the website and I'll share that on the Facebook page and I will share it on Twitter and Instagram and all those, the usual places. Um, so if you're looking for your calendar, I was looking at pricing today. The calendar itself, and this isn't completely set in stone, so forgive me if it changes a little bit, but the calendar will be eleven ninety nine. The difficulty with Ireland and postage rates is that the postage rates are quite expensive. Uh, so uh, for a similar size calendar in a tube, uh, the postage actually to the States uh, brings it, believe it or not, up to about 21 euros. So there's an extra nine euros there for postage uh, and the cost of the tube, etc., etc. So um, if you're in Ireland, you will probably end up paying... Um, I, th I know I think I wrote these kind of rough guide prices down. So this is roughly how it's going to work out. Ireland, you'll pay 19, UK 20, Europe 20, 50, and USA 21, 50. I think that's how I worked it out um, for your calendar. So I'll set that up tomorrow, hopefully, and I'll reveal the, the final cover, the draft cover. Uh, it's an A3 calendar. It's vertical. So half the page is a picture and then... The, the dates below and somebody was asking will there be room to write on there will be uh it's not tiny uh, there's room for writing uh just to say too also on patreon i know I've, I've been doing quite a lot for patrons lately so you know how patreon works that when there's a new video that's released for patrons uh they see it for a while sometimes for several months before the ordinary public get to ordinary there's nothing ordinary about any of the public uh there's nothing ordinary about any of you uh, but normally what I do is when I release a video for the patrons, I also release one that has been previously patron only uh, to the public. So uh, you'll see, hopefully, when I release one for the patrons only, I also release one for the public. The patrons at a certain level, uh, the uh, I'm not, I think it's the Iron Age patrons, uh, they have started to receive their merchandise uh, so there's a free mug at a certain level and there's a free poster. And soon, hopefully, all going well, there'll be a free T-shirt for people at certain levels. I must share pictures of the mugs with you when I get a chance. Anyway, as usual, before we get stuck into the episode proper, just to mention that if you would like to support Mythical Ireland, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. And I'll paste that in there as a link, as a comment underneath the video here on YouTube and on Facebook. Um, yes, yeah, so today's free release uh, for the public was Podcast 11, which was an interview with uh, media student Neve Phelan. Now, that interview was conducted at least a year ago, I think it was the summer of last year, but it was only released um, in about three months ago for patrons. Um, and I think it's almost an hour long. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, the other thing was that I hope you all saw the link for the Off the Lead podcast interview that I did with Fran McKeown. 
Um, <laughs> sorry. I should say that um, uh, sorry, I need to share that. How do I share that? I should say that that is almost four hours long. That's a long one. That's the sort of thing you, you listen to um, you know, when you're on a long drive or you're on a long bus journey or excuse me, or you're you're cooking something in the kitchen and you're going to be there for several hours. Um hang on till I just see if I can get this. Yes. Okay. So I'll paste that in as well. So that's something um that maybe you might be interested in listening to. We cover an awful lot of topics. Uh, including drone henge and drones and all of that and archaeology, but lots of philosophical stuff too, uh, and about the state of the world. And I hope we didn't. I hope I didn't strike a pessimistic note in it. Anne Scott Doherty says hello, everyone. Folge and great to see you in the house. We'll just tidy up the last few comments before we start. I will be wanting a calendar, says Rowan. Brilliant stuff. The book will be en route soon, says Teresa. Yet yeah, tomorrow, all going well. All of the rest of the. The, uh, the books will be in the post tomorrow. Uh, so, fingers crossed. Okay. And on YouTube, um, did I miss anyone? Ginger's Ireland is saying, hello, Folge. Uh, the Curious Celt is in Antrim. I hope I find you all well. Hello, the Curious Celt, Folge along. Tip top nine. Look forward to receiving the book tomorrow. Brilliant. Well, as I said, make sure you let us know when it arrives and share the joy. Okay, so that's now, uh, what is that, 26, we we'll call it 26.45. So tonight, um, we're taking a little break from trees. We will be back to trees because we have a few more trees to do, you know, uh, before uh, we get uh, sidetracked by other discussions, uh, which we're doing today because of the day that's in it because of the fact that Ireland 2020 is finally here. The decision was announced early in the year that it was going to be reprinted. Uh, the original uh, schedule was for May, then COVID came along, and the revised schedule was for August. There was a considerable delay with the printing. Uh, that was about a month of a delay, and so it has finally arrived uh, towards the back end of September. Anyway, I hope you all uh, get yours soon and enjoy it. The story of Island of the Setting Sun really is the story, it's very hard to extract, not that I would want to, but the story of Island of the Setting Sun is inevitably intertwined with the story of Mythical Ireland and is also inevitably intertwined with my uh, um, story of your branching out, says Tom King. <laughs> That's my kind of joke. <laughs> Uh, uh, inevitably it is also bound up with sorry just tightening my chair also um uh, bound up with the story of my friendship with richard moore and of course all that began in january of 1999 i think i've told this story on a couple of episodes uh, but um you know i had expected a visit from richard he was very interested in learning astronomy and uh, he had heard from somebody uh, I think it was Michael Byrne, uh, who was an astronomer, a mutual friend of ours, that uh, there's a certain fellow that works in the Drahad Independent called Anthony Murphy, and he knows a thing or two about astronomy. I hope you weren't led astray in that belief, Richard. Uh, Aaron McMahon says hello from the west coast of, the, of Canada. Hello, Aaron. Thank you for joining us. And so on that January day, which I think was the 20th or the 21st of January, 1999, uh, Richard Moore walked into the office of the Drogheda Independent in Shop Street in Drogheda and asked to see me. And I can only describe that meeting uh, as life-changing, uh, as fateful, uh, and as one which immediately, within a short time, uh, set the hairs standing up on the back of my neck. Um, it seemed as if in the space of one conversation, I'm not sure how long we were, talking for julie king is in from nina sitting in with tea and toasty nice sounds good julie hope you're uh, keeping well and uh, that conversation probably went on for about an hour at the end of which i think now looking back i can certainly say uh, that in in the space of an hour uh, i had found one of my life's great purposes it's it's a funny thing it's like you kind of 
it, it comes to you, you know, you don't realize it. Um, and you overthink it sometimes. What am I doing here? You know, Jim Conway is uh, in Lurgan where he says it's autumnal. Alan Hoskins says arrived late. Hi all from Ballina and Tipperary. This is a no brown zone. So glad to see no apologies. We just literally started anyway. Um, so the reason the conversation was exciting to me was because Richard, well, at the time he had proposed to do this uh, large scale sort of public art installation, which would involve setting down standing stones in the shape of a constellation, perhaps Orion, but the member stones of which would align towards various sunrises and moonrises and star rises and settings, you know, and I was tremendously excited about that. And he said, look, I don't really know any astronomy and I'd like to learn. But at the same time, he started pointing, he took out a drawing of one of the decorated stones in the chamber of Nauth's uh, eastern uh, tomb and uh, proceeded to, to suggest that perhaps there were stars and constellations carved on there. And of course, that, you know, really was one of those moments where you get your your collar grabbed and you get pulled in, you know? So it was like Richard was grabbing me by the collar and pulling me in, you know? And um, everything changed uh, because that was the beginning of what was to be. Uh, Tom Breslin says, hello from Carmel in New York. Falcha, Tom, good evening to you. Uh, that was to be the beginning of a very fruitful friendship, uh, a very uh, fascinating uh, exploration. And, you know, if you think about January 98 to November 2006, uh, you know, so January 99 to January 2000 is one year. So 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. It was seven and a half years in the making. Uh, not too far off, eight years, actually. Uh, island um it was uh it was a, a fascinating um intuitive um speculative um and serendipity and synchronicity laden journey and i think we touched on some of those i think it was at episode 45 where I spoke about uh, spontaneity, serendipity, synchronicity, the three S's. And Mark Gordon says, good day, fault you, Mark. And it was that kind of journey. Anyway, uh, we were certainly alternative. Uh, in fact, some people might say Ireland is a little bit of a, a fringe book. Um, and I always thought that, you know, in the exploration of it, and I'm going to go through it now and just tell you exactly, well, not exactly, but I'm going to give you an overview of, of the journey and what's in it. I always thought, you know, that we were definitely pushing the bounds of um, speculation. We were definitely pushing new ideas. But I always felt, and I still feel today, that, we we never disputed the archaeology or the science or the data. Uh, in fact, I would say that we supported it. Um, you know, I think that was very important, actually. Um, it did make some leaps and bounds in terms of imagination. I don't have any regrets about that. As far as I'm concerned, the proper way to make an exploration of the monumental and the mythic landscape is to do so imaginatively, exactly as uh, might have been inspired by the great poet of the Milesians, uh, Amergin, uh, who arrived in Ireland. And some of you may have uh, listened to the special program on Lyric FM that I put the link up to yesterday, thanks to Nora uh, Gaffney uh, O'Connor, who posted that link to me in the first place. Um, you know, that the words on the cover of the book are actually attributed to uh, Amergin. He, he apparently said, uh, you know, these were among the things he said, what land is better than this island of the setting sun? And we lie in such a position that 
we're, we're, we're like a little bit of an antithesis or a mirror of Japan, which is a, a sort of an island country off the great landmass of uh, Asia out in the Pacific Ocean. And they are known, of course, as the land of the rising sun. And I thought, what a beautifully, you know, when I was writing the book, I hadn't thought of a name. I said, look, we'll think about that towards the end. And we had two suggestions for the publisher. One suggestion was the high man and something about the return of the king, which was borrowed, of course, from Lord of the Rings. And the other title was exactly as we suggested it, Island of the Setting Sun, subtitle In Search of Ireland's Ancient Astronomers. And uh, when we had a discussion with Liffey Press, they said, look, we absolutely prefer this one. And uh, and so that was the way it went. But a long time before any of that happened, there was this remarkable uh, journey of uh, exploration. So Richard, thankfully, was very familiar with not only the landscape, having, you know, he's, and he still is a landscape artist, um, you know, he was very familiar with the Boyne landscape, but he was also familiar enough with a lot of the stories and the myths, which I found fascinating. And from the moment he started telling me those, I just wanted to learn more about them. So it was very much a two-way thing. Initially, the idea was, Anthony, you're going to teach me a bit of astronomy for my project. And in return, I felt I was getting a great amount of knowledge. But actually what transpired was in a short space of time, we were starting to visit the landscape and visit monuments. And we were starting to make observations and record things and take measurements. We would often bring a ship's compass, which Richard had, uh, to sites to take magnetic measurements. Um, phot photography was a big part of it. Sometimes Richard would sketch or paint. Um, we would me measure things out. Uh, and, well, the purpose of that was uh, not in immediately cleared because we didn't know where that all was going to lead, but it wasn't too long, I think, before we started talking about the possibility of a book. It made sense anyway, seeing that I was in journalism and was working in the newspaper business and was a reporter and, and was writing. It made s sense that, um, you know, it should be... Um, it should be something that we would do uh, to write to write a book. Now, the first of the major sort of steps towards that uh, occurred in the year 1999. In the summer of that year, um, uh, Richard and I uh, and Michael Byrne visited the Standing Stones in Baltray, which are very, very little known. And um, while there, Richard pointed out that Michael had placed his binoculars up against the surface of the stone and it, it seemed that the long axis of the stone was pointing out to the sea, to uh, the Rockabill Islands, uh, which are off the coast of Skerries in County Dublin. Patricia Langton, who's uh, watching with us tonight, has a website all about Rockabill. You might share the website address uh, link with us, uh, Patricia, which also uh, discusses some of the mythology. Um, and I, visiting in the summertime, Based on the measurements, I said, I think that's winter solstice sunrise, that line from the large Baltray stone to Rockabill. But of course, we weren't going to be able to prove that until December. And uh, when it was observed, of course, we were thrilled. And I think that was really the, the proper beginning of it all. That was like, now we have made a, a revelation or a discovery. Now we've seen something that hasn't been seen before. Um, and of course, because it's a slab of shale, of grey wacky, because you can see Clotter Head from Baltray, and because it overlooks the place of Inverculpa where the Boyne meets the sea, it, it was natural to assume that perhaps it had been set there. Reimagine Rockabill.com. Thank you, Patricia, for that. Check that website out, folks. Add that to your uh, uh, bookmarks. Um, it made sense that perhaps the stone might have been set down uh, by the same people who were building the great monuments of Brunabonia. And remember that they were passing this spot regularly on their way up and down to Clarher Head to collect the grey wacky for the stones, which we're told were brought by sea and river. And so Baltray was the big sort of starting point. You know, it was one thing to say that you were doing research, but it's an entirely different thing to be able to say, well, we've actually found something. That was followed in the summer of 
the year 2000 with uh, <laughs> uh, I always think it's funny, you know, the dedication um, that's required. I remember uh, the summer solstice sunrise uh, in, in June of 2000. Um, we had to be in place at the Great Henge at Douth Hall, Site Q, uh, at something like half past four in the morning. And we were rewarded when the sun rose. Uh, Julianne Osborne is in the house. Hello from Oregon, my friend. Hello, Julianne. Long time no see. Well, I know that we keep up regular contact on Facebook, which is brilliant. But I anyway, hope you're keeping well. Um, so uh, we were rewarded because the sun came up and it came up in line with these two gaps in the banks of Site Q. So there was another significant step forward. I didn't realize at that time that this Henge was going to be um, problematic in terms of the interpretation of its features and that that was going to stall the book for a while. Anyway, it did, but it didn't do us any harm eventually. I think uh, the universe is a funny way of uh, making things happen. Uh, and um, certainly if you if you watch that episode, uh, Synchronicity, Serendipity and Spontaneity, episode 45, uh, you'll know just how much uh, that strange coincidences can happen. In fact, uh, so we set out, and I would take a lot of notes, and Richard would take a lot of drawings, and Richard was also doing a lot of research and no note-taking. And we would telephone each other regularly. This is before smartphones. This is before, well, it wasn't before the internet, but internet back then in the year 2000 was dial-up. It was tremendously slow. I had an old Dell computer, and I used to have to disconnect the phone line and connect the modem to the phone socket and dial up just to get onto the internet. I set up Mythical Ireland in March of 2000 as a way of disseminating some of the information and pictures. And uh, it seemed to get immediate sort of feedback that people liked this approach that we were taking. But um, I, used to, I used to sit on the bottom of the stairs uh, and that's as far as the phone would reach with the cable stretched we're, we're not talking cordless phones here, folks. We're talking wired phones. I know, it's only 20 years ago. I'm making it sound like it was the 1960s. And I used to sit on the bottom of the stairs with a notebook and a pen, scribbling feverishly as myself and Richard were having conversations. But what, what quite often happened, and I found this really interesting and incredible at the time, we used to call them spooky coincidences. But of course, over time, we realized what we were seeing was what Jung would describe as synchronicity, uh, events that were not causally related uh, but the likelihood of them happening seemed remote such that we would ask a question and you know it would be one of a series of questions and I'd be saying well Richard why don't I look for the answer to that in such and such a book maybe Lady Gregory or Ancient Irish Tales or Charles Squire's book or you know MacKillop's Oxford uh, Celtic uh, Encyclopedia of Myth and um, you know I would literally sit down and I would I would open the book on a page and I go and immediately something would jump out that was in answer to either the question we were exactly looking to answer or in one of the questions we had asked earlier in the conversation or the previous day. Literally, I would open the book and the words would jump straight out at me. And I'm like, oh, Richard, listen to this. You're never going to believe this. And the amount of times we had those conversations um, and it was there was a sort of a, a real magical element to it. It really felt, and I can say this now, you know, without fear of, of, of censure or ridicule, um, it, it really felt that there was a hidden hand helping things along. And I, I know there are some of you who may be sceptical about that, and I know there's some of you who will ex exactly know what I'm talking about, uh, but the hidden hand that helps you when you're, on your path, you know, when you're doing something that perhaps is your life's purpose, following your bliss, as Joseph Campbell would say. So we began to formulate a sort of a broad plan for a book, but we were just continually doing research and site visits. Now, Richard, you'll laugh at this, but I mean, I remember one in particular, we were looking for standing stones up on a hill called Carnan Brega in the middle of Louth, not far from a place called Piperstown. And we were it was dusk, you know, and the sun had gone down and it was getting dark. And 
we couldn't find there was there was there was there were three or four standing stones and we only found one of them and we were going around among heather and rocks and gorse bushes and then eventually we came to the peak of a hill and there was a, a herd of bullocks and richard had no problem being among cattle because he'd spent half his lifetime painting in fields you know but <laughs> I was nervous of cattle. And, and I remember saying, look, Richard, I think we better get out of here. <laughs> he scarpered off down the side of the hill. And of course, the bullocks, being uh, young and curious, decided to follow us in a sort of a stampede. <laughs> and the faster we went, the faster they came after us. And it was very hard to see where you were going, you know. Around that time also, we started to spend time, not that Richard was a stranger to it at all, because Richard did a lot of painting at night. But, you know, uh, I started to take photographs in low light at twilight and at nighttime and learned, with the help of Richard, um, a, a, a technique that we would call now painting with light where you put the camera on a tripod, you open the shutter for 30 seconds or a minute or whatever. And with a torch or a flash or a candle or something, you light the megalithic art or whatever it is you're trying to light, create light on the subject. Um, and learned pretty quickly that this was very neat, a very neat way of doing things. Back then also, <laughs> I have to tell you, the, the limits of technology compared to what we have today, for goodness sake, it's incredible. Um, Back then, I was taking all my pictures on, on negative and on slide phone. Uh, and all of that had to be scanned for the internet or for print, you know, on a flatbed scanner or a slide scanner, which I didn't have. So the slide scanning had to be done, excuse me, commercially uh, in, the local, um, in the local photography shop, uh, which is also a chemist or a pharmacy here, Mars Chemist in Drogheda. And uh, so I even remember, you know, when Mythical Ireland got going, I wanted it to be picture heavy. But the problem was back then, because everyone was on dial up, you had to really minimize the size of all your pictures. So you had to reduce the scale of them in Photoshop. But you also had to reduce the uh, uh, you had to reduce the uh, the uh, resolution, the dots per inch or the PPI, the pixels per inch. And you also had to compress it. So that your file, your your picture files should generally have been below 10 kilobytes each. Now, I regularly upload stuff today to the website and to the blog that would be 100 kilobytes and maybe 130, 150. So that goes to show you how much uh, better we have things these days. If you did a, a search for images uh, tw 20 years ago on the Internet, uh, you would invariably find tiny little images that couldn't be blown up. You, you know, now uh, we, we're, we're totally spoiled, of course. Don't mention drones because that's changed everything. But um, so uh, the discoveries gave us a little bit of traction, I think, you know. Uh, we also became particularly interested in the story of Amergen and the Milesians and the invasion myths, not least because A, the two of the Danon, the deities, were uh, intimately associated in the mythology with Brunabonia and Newgrange and the construction of the major sites. But also because the Milesians, when they finally arrived after the storm at sea, you know, they arrived into Ireland and met Bamba, Fola and Eru uh, on their way up to Ishnach. And then they went to Tara, where they met Makul, Makecht and Magrania, the, the th th three kings. And they were told, if you put out to sea and you come back again, if you can land successfully, we'll give you the island. And of course, they did land successfully at Inverculpa, at the Boyne Estuary, which is literally, I mean, if you were able to sit here and, and look through the wall here, uh, about two miles uh, east of me here, for where I'm sitting. And I think Richard and I ha shared one thing, which is a great passion for the mythic and folkloric past of Drogheda that seemed to have gone under the radar. Um, it's not that it had been ignored. It's just that previous generations of historians who were interested in folklore and mythology in, in the early part of the 20th century in particular, uh, that that, that uh, interest by historians in folklore seems to have separated out uh, over time, uh, such that if you're into folklore, you're into folklore, and if you're into history, you're into history, and never the twain shall meet. So we found that, you know, you had to talk to a particular type of person, 
like the folklorist uh, uh, Kellen, B Kathleen, uh, Banny Carberry, uh, Mrs. Carberry, um, who uh, ran a pub in Drogheda, uh, which held uh, regular Irish traditional music sessions. And she was a Gaelgore. She spoke fluent Irish as well. Uh, or the likes of Dermot Fairclough or, you know, a few specific individuals who had a particular interest in the mythology and folklore. And yet we were reading in the annals of Ulster and the annals of the Four Masters that the Vikings or the Danes, as they were called, then we're going to have to, after the recent DNA discoveries, we're going to have to rename the Danes the Norwegians because we now know that uh, the uh, Irish Vikings had more Norwegian blood and the English Vikings had more Danish blood. But that the Vikings had raided the great monuments of the Boyne and included in the list was the cave of the wife of Gubon, uh, the uh, the smith, uh, Tom King, you'll be interested in this one, at Drochat Oha in Drogheda. And of course, this was before, this is listed as happening in 860. Two and 863, I think, depending on which annals you read. Now, that's 9th century. Now, remember that the historians had been telling people that the mound of Millmount uh, was built by the Normans. And, of course, the Normans arrived into Ireland in 1160. I can never remember. Is it 69 or is it 68? It's 69, folks, isn't it? Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. There's a, the opening of Chapter 3 of Ireland of the Setting Zone with a beautiful painting of Millmount by Richard Moore. And so this mound, which supports the Martello Tower, the Martello Tower is an early 19th century construction. Uh, before that, there was a mill up here, Delahoyd's Mill, which is why it's called Millmount, apparently, although I fancifully suggested an island that perhaps it's because the son of Mill is supposed to be buried there, Armigan, who knows. But anyway, this mound was said to have been constructed by the Normans probably in the late 12th or the early 13th century. And and and, and as far as the, the history of the site seems to have gone, well, that's as far back as it goes. But then we discovered that, well, hang on a second, it's not that we discovered, but we realised that a lot of people were talking about the myth and the folklore and saying that, well, Millmount is supposed to be much older than that, you know, and it's connected with Brunabonia in the annals. There's a suggestion locally that it's the burial place of Ar Amergen. And also... Uh, there's this reference to the wife of the Gubon, possibly a deity, uh, Gubon being the smith of the Dedanans later, Gubon Sayre, which is like a, a medieval sort of reincarnation of the myth or revivification of the myth uh, of the smith. And so it was fascinating. We even heard rumours uh, that in former times, uh, people of Drogheda remembered uh, in the not too distant past, we're only going back a few generations, even in the 20th century, it was a suggestion that people remembered being able to enter tunnels and underground passages under Millmount. Of course, given its military history, it's not entirely unlikely that there might have been uh, tunnels under there um, for uh, uh, soldiery, uh, for soldiers, etc. Who knows? Uh, but certainly, uh, I think it's a funny thing, but after Ireland was published, certain things began to happen. And I'm not suggesting that Ireland necessarily led to these things happening. But I just do think it's interesting that we also uh, talked about Slain, the mound at Slain, Dostlanya. And there is a Norman castle moat, or the remains of one at Slain, on the top of the hill of Slain. That again was being portrayed as a, a, a Norman moat. Uh, and Norman moats, we now know in, in, in at least, uh, I think, in at least a half a dozen cases, probably more, uh, Norman moats were actually built on pre-existing burial mounds, mounds that had been there since the Bronze Age and even since the Neolithic. And of course, that makes sense. If you're coming in uh, as a, uh, you know, to take over the place and and to sort of announce your dominance or to 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 portray your dominance of that place, uh, then it makes sense. If you if you're going to build a, a castle on a mound, that rather than go to the uh, the great labour of having to build a mound. If there's one there already, you just have to fortify it and perhaps build it up a little bit. So that made sense. And so uh, after Ireland was published, uh, examinations were being made uh, archaeologically through remote sensing of the mound at Slane and also eventually at Millmount. A big project in the past decade has been Mars, which I mentioned in the interview with uh, Fran McKeown, the Off the Lead podcast, which I shared a little while ago. 
that MARS, which stands for Millmount Archaeological Remote Sensing, was trying to determine whether there was any evidence that, in fact, Millmount was not only A, 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 a mount that was older than the Norman period, but B, was there anything in there that might suggest passage tomb, that might suggest something older than, you know, um, you know, um, older than Christianity, certainly older than the Normans. Now, the results of that are not definitive by any means. Um, and it's a question of interpreting data. The very best way to determine anything archaeologically is to dig it and find dateable evidence. We can't do that in the case of Millmount because it has this big Martello Tower sitting on the top of it. And undoubtedly, if you tried to, uh, to dig uh, underneath that mount, uh, you would probably find it, you would cause some collapse. So there's Millmount as it overlooks this again, Island of the Setting Sun. This is the first edition, by the way. I'll show you all editions in a moment. So you can see here's the river. It, it occupies a real commanding view over the town. I mean, if you've ever been to Drogheda and you've only been once and you've only passed through the town, it is highly likely that you've seen Millmount, you know. And then just to show you a picture, this is Richard Moore's photograph, a beautiful photo taken in the winter with a bit of snow on the ground of Dua Slania. Because anytime I've been up there, a lot of my pictures and my videos, you'll hear reference to it. But uh, from, you know, the eastern side of the hill, it's always shrouded with overgrowth and trees and you can never see it. So this is a great picture because it actually shows the mound. And you can see that it has quite a flat top, you know. So at one time, uh, again, in the uh, 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 12th, 13th century. This may have had a castle or a, a fortified structure on top of it. But the idea is in the Dinshanicus, the Dinshanicus suggests that there's a mound that's slain Do Slania, which is the burial place of Slania, the Furbulag king, or the Furbulag king, uh, who was one of five kings who had partitioned Ireland into uh, segments, as it were, and the largest one uh, was bounded uh, by the Boyne to the north, I think, and he was the king of that segment. But after his death, he was buried at this mound. And that's where Slane gets its name from, Slonia, the King Slonia. So let's just take you briefly on the journey as it happened. So Baltray is the first chapter, okay, and it's called Balor's Strand Discoveries and Beginnings. That, that was a bit of a stretch to connect it with Balor's Strand. But you see, after we made the discovery, then came the mythology. We learned that there were two fascinating stories which we think are directly related to Baltray. <laughs> One is in the Ulster Cycle in Thoinbo Cúlnia, uh, where um, after, you know, after Cúlnia had gone to Scotland to train with Scahawk, uh, he befriended this woman, Aoife, even though Emer was his lover, uh, apparently his one love, uh, he, he had bedded Aoife and uh, she had uh, bore a son and uh, the son's name was Cunla and he was coming uh, over to Ireland to be introduced to his father. They met at the Strand, which I have no doubt is Baltray because there were two standing stones overlooking uh, the, the shoreline. Um, and the fascinating thing geologically, we learned also from Professor Frank Mitchell, uh, the late great Professor Frank Mitchell, who was many things. He was a geologist, an archaeologist, an anthropologist, a historian, um, one of these polymaths, you know, that, you know, while the Baltray stones now have a golf course, sand dunes between them and the sea, about a half a mile distant, uh, that in the Neolithic, the sea would have come right up against the bottom of the bluff over which the the larger, well, the, over which the standing stones look. So there's a, a bit of a, quite a fall in front of that stone where the land just falls down by about 30 or 40 or 50 feet onto a lower level. And so Cunlach comes ashore and basically Cucullan fights him and doesn't realise that it's his son and fights him to the death, believe it or not. Uh, which is a tragic story of the uh, 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 the uh, the Toyn or the Ulster cycle. The other one I, I found fascinating, and and Richard, of course, did too, was the story of Balor, who had stolen the uh, magic cow, the Glasgowan, um, from Ulster and was bringing it down along the coast with its calf, and uh, everything was going well until they crossed the Boyne, and at that point, uh, the uh, the calf. Um, the cow fell behind the calf, was it? No, the calf 
fell behind the cow and the cow turned around to look where the calf was and could see immediately that they had been led astray far from home and let out a scream. And when that scream was was let out, uh, Balor opened his baleful eye. He was like a cyclops with this gigantic burning eye. Think about the sun in its baleful or destructive aspect. Uh, and he opened his eye to have a look at what was going on. And immediately the cow and the calf became uh, petrified or uh, frozen into, not frozen, burnt, one would say, into rocks. And today, uh, the islands, uh, one of them, the larger island has a, a, a lighthouse on it. Uh, and so you have the smaller island to the north and the larger island to the south to reflect the position of the cow and the calf when uh, Balor opened his eye. But of course, this was in in imaginative and in uh, um, mythic uh, uh, symbolism. Uh, this was a portrayal of the winter solstice sunrise uh, behind the stones. And of course, you're looking across the estuary of the Boyne towards this. And the critical thing is that when they cross the Boyne, that's when the story changes, that there's the two standing stones uh, looking out at this these islands. Uh, and it seems to suggest that you're looking to the islands for winter solstice. Uh, chapter two is called Culpa, the invasion of the Milesians, and tended to concentrate a little bit more on, on Amergin and the landing of the Milesians and the death of one of the brothers. Of course, we know about the, 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 the death of Dunn uh, off the southwest coast, um, but there was another brother, Culpa, who uh, died in the sea storm and it was brought ashore, apparently, and buried uh, in a mound not too far from the Boyne uh, at Col Cope, C-O-L-P-E, which is an anglicization of the very old name of the place, Culpa. And he's described as uh, Culpa the Swordsman. Anyway, this was where we really sort of set the scene um, for, you know, or at least sort of gave an explanation for where the cover came from. And again, those of you who listen to the Lyric FM program will have heard this already, um, you know, but the the song of Amergin or the invocation of Amergin, I invoke the land of Eru, the shining, shining sea, the fertile, fertile hill, the wooded vale, the river abundant in water, the fishful, fishful lake. And then this very famous uh, Amergin's the song of Amergin or the chant of Amergin or the poem of Amergin. I am the wind that blows upon the sea and there are several translations of this. I am the ocean wave. I am the murmur of the surges. I am seven battalions. I am a strong bull. I am an eagle on a rock. I am a ray of the sun. I am the most beautiful of herbs. I am a courageous wild boar. I am a salmon in the water. I am a lake upon a plain. I am a cunning artist. There you go, Richard. I am a gigantic sword-wielding champion. I can shift my shape like a god. In which direction shall we go? Shall we hold our council in the valley or on the mountaintop? Where shall we make our home? What land is better than this island of the setting sun? Where shall we walk to and fro in peace and safety? Who can find you clear springs of water as I can? Who can tell you the age of the moon but I? There's the uh, astronomer, Amergen. Who can tell the fish from the depths of the sea as I can? Who can cause them to come near the shore as I can? Who can change the shapes of the hills and headlands as I can? I am a bard who is called upon by seafarers to prophesy. Javelins shall be wielded to avenge our wrongs. I prophesy victory. I end my song by prophesying all other good things. And of course, they were victorious because the moment he planted his foot on the shore of the Boyne River at Inverculpa, the estuary of the Boyne, they had enacted a great victory over the Dedanans because the Dedanans told them, if you can get back to the island, we'll give it to you. And of course, they were true to their word. We then proceeded to the chapter about uh, Millmount, and we called it Millmount, the burial place of the astronomer, and precisely because Amergin, among many other things, claimed to know the ages of the moon and the place where the sun set, who calls the, uh, the cattle of Tethra and sees them dance in the bright heavens, is one of the things he says. Yeah, the Milesians came from Spain, according to uh, Laura Gowalla. And uh, so without going back over ground that we've covered already. The Millmount chapter deals with the idea that uh, the monument of Millmount had a much more ancient 
uh, origin. Uh, it, uh, it had a legacy that stretched much, much further back than the Normans. One of the things that we did with Milmant was to examine uh, possible astronomical alignments. And we found it very interesting that uh, from Milmount, the sun sets on the winter solstice on the shortest days. It sets uh, towards the hill of Tara. And at the time of the equinoxes, not precisely at the equinoxes, but let's be honest, we saw how Cairn T is aligned several degrees south of east, uh, but yet admits the sun on the equinox. Um, the sun sets over the hill of Slain about two days after vernal equinox and two days before autumn equinox when viewed from Milman. So here's a picture. This was taken 22nd of March, 2004. And you can see the sun. There's the peak of the hill of Slain. And in amongst those trees is the burial mound of Slaunia. Uh, Dua Slaunia. Uh, Slaunia's burial mound. So about two days later, the sun sets directly into the hill. Uh, so they... Uh, appear to have a sort of an alignment what's interesting too is that when you're in Cairn T which you can't be anymore uh, because it's now locked because of subsidence if you're sitting crouched in the end of the chamber looking out through the entrance you're actually looking towards the hill of slain so it's highly unlikely that that's accidental Cairn T was aligned so that it was pointing towards the hill of slain and the equinox sunrise and the connection of slain and equinox of course is cemented really in the story of St. Patrick, who comes and lights the Paschal fire, the Easter fire. And of course, uh, Easter, if Anthony reads from his own book, is he breaching his own copyright? <laughs> uh, don't worry. Uh, I'm, I'm not likely to take action against myself, Paula. It's okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, Easter being calculated from the vernal equinox, um, first full moon after the vernal equinox traditionally, but in the modern church, the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox. We also found it very interesting then because the next chapter is Tara, which was connected with Millmount astronomically. Uh, chapter four is called Tara, seat of the sky king instead of the high king. <laughs> and we found it very interesting. Uh, this is when we started to explore the constellation Orion and its seeming um, uh, significance, uh, which is we, we later found was very important to the whole story and some of the principal characters of Irish mythology may have been inspired by it, that when you're at Amrigan's Mount, uh, Orion appears to set uh, over uh, the Hill of Tara. And it's almost as if he's standing on the uh, the sacred stone of Tara. I did a sort of a, it's a very sim simple diagram showing Orion setting over the Hill of Tara and the Leah Foyle and uh, all sorts of speculation, you could call it, uh, about, you know, uh, the meanings, you know, uh, of that uh, and the coincidence of it. The Mount of the Hostages with its alignment towards uh, the Samhain and Imbolc sunrises marking the beginning of uh, winter and the beginning of summer. Chapter 5 then follows on, that's called Cosmic Circles, the Giant Rings. And of course, we know now, I think we knew then anyway, but they're not precise circles, none of the hinges. And this refers more to the large ceremonial enclosures, the embanked closures, <coughs> including Site Q, the Douth Henge, which there's a plan of there. And you'll see there a photo of a, fo of a photo. I'm actually in that photo uh, taking a picture of the sunrise on summer solstice 2000 when we became, we think, uh, the first humans in the modern era to observe this. Uh, but we later met by complete synchronicity uh, and the most extraordinary coincidence. And again, I've spoken about this on at least one occasion in episode 45. Uh, we met uh, Ronald Hicks uh, at Millmount uh, on summer solstice 2005, uh, five years later. And uh, he told us that he had suggested exactly that in a paper in 1985. He had suggested that the gaps or the openings or the entrances to the Great Henge of Douth were aligned on the solstices and was delighted to hear that we had witnessed and photographed it. And it was after corresponding with Professor Hicks when he had gone home. We met him at Millmount, by the way. Um, and of course, that's detailed in a section in the book that has its own little heading, and that heading is synchronicity, because uh, it, it was so extraordinary that we felt that we had to include a description, uh, an account of this amazing coincidence in the book. And uh, when he had returned to the States 
he's he's a professor uh, of uh, anthropology and Ball State University, Muncie, Indiana. Uh, we began to correspond by email, and in those in that series of emails, uh, I found out an awful lot uh, that I didn't know. And of course, it helped me to finally put the book together because at that time, 2005, I was struggling a bit to join the sections. The first part dealing with the Boynestri, Baltre, Drogheda, uh, and the second part, which go, kind of goes from Bruna Bonia downwards. And this was the chapter that was linking them. And uh, Ronald Hicks helped uh, to, to cement that link, as it were. And then the second part of that chapter deals with a site that you will know I've been quite passionate about and written quite a lot about over the past uh, couple of decades. And that's the one we called Ireland's Stonehenge, the now destroyed monument at Carnbeg outside Dundalk. Uh, and I've written a lot more about that in quite a detailed chapter in my book, Mythical Ireland, New Light on the Ancient Past. Um, and it just dealt with the idea that, it, you know, that the scholars of the 20th century had heard it said about this place that it was a school of astronomy, but they couldn't indicate the source of that information. They didn't know where, where it had come from, unfortunately. Chapter six is called Doubt, the Darkening of the Sky. And that deals, uh, that chapter in, it deals entirely with uh, doubt, uh, with, you know, the archeological description of it. The fact that the winter solstice sun, when it's setting, shines into the southern chamber there, something that had been discovered about Martin Brennan and Jack Roberts and Hank Harrison in the winter of 1980, um, and something that had been um, observed in more detail at the time we were writing this book by uh, a local woman, Anne-Marie Moroni. Uh, but also then, um, the myth of doubt from the Dinchenicus, uh, which is the myth about, that's been repeated in the DNA uh, paper, the myth about uh, the king who brings all the men of Ireland to build him a tower from which he could pass to heaven. And this, this, his sister casts a magic spell on the sun to make it stand still in the heavens. And eventually the spell is broken because they commit incest. Uh, but also uh, the lunar function or the possible lunar function of the monument, monument and the coincidence that the number of curbstones could be half the number of synodic lunar months in a rotation of the nodes or the moon swing cycle, which if you were studying it in prehistory, uh, you would you would be also naturally uh, leading towards um, uh, the study of eclipses. Um, because if you see one, you see the other. Um, you know, um, that, you know, as the, the moon's nodes rotate through the sky, you get... Uh, the standstills of the moon, but you also get eclipse patterns. And so one thing leads to the other, leads to the other. And so um, it seemed to me anyway obvious at the time, and I do say in the new uh, foreword, which I will, or the new preface, uh, which I will uh, read to you before we finish, it seemed to me obvious at the time, and it still seems obvious that some of the myths appear to describe functions of the monuments. Now, there's arguments, of course, that we've learned about in the interim uh, with the academics about, you know, what they believe was, a, a, you know, a lot of academics don't give any thought to the possibility that a myth that was written down by monks in medieval Christian Ireland could possibly carry information from Neolithic Ireland. And I think they dismiss that far too easily. And in fact, the fact that uh, NG10, uh, the uh, the male at Newgrange who was found to have incest incestuous parents, confirms mythology about Newgrange and Douth. Um, it's like the science is not dismissing the myth; it's uh, it's actually proving the myth. And there are several instances of of that. Um, so that's a very interesting chapter, I think. Uh, chapter seven and eight are both about Newgrange. Chapter seven is called Newgrange: The Cygnus Enigma. Uh, with a painting at night of Cygnus over Newgrange, again, uh, by my wonderful artist, co-author friend, Richard Moore, uh, who I think is still there, still watching us. Um, and this is about a fascinating correlation of 
the monument of Newgrange with the constellation Cygnus and the fact that there's a proliferation of swan mythology in not just in ancient Ireland, but two very prominent myths pertaining to Newgrange involving swans, one being the fa very, very well-known Ashlinga Anguso, uh, the dream vision of Angus uh, and his swan maiden Care, and the other being the story of how Destiny, uh, arrives at Newgrange, having chased swans from Awan Macha with her brother, or in some versions, her father, uh, uh, Connor McNessa. And um, uh, when she's at Newgrange, uh, she is visited by Lou, who tells her that she's going to have a child, uh, and that child will be Setanta later to become Cucullin, one of our most illustrious uh, mythical characters of mythology. Uh, and of course, examining the astronomical aspect of that. Um, so looking at what Cygnus was doing at the time Newgrange was built, looking at the fact that Newgrange points to Fornox, although neither is visible from the other, and that Fornox points to the place where the, the bright star of Cygnus was rising off the horizon in the Neolithic. Uh, and both sites are uh, cruciform in plan. Uh, uh, Fornox, you know, uh, it's like a cross overlaid with an egg. And in fact, I found it very interesting that if you overlaid the uh, the outline of Site Q, the Douth Henge on top of it, uh, they were very, very similarly shaped, which I thought was fascinating. But anyway, I don't want to give too much away. I want you to actually buy the 2020 edition, add it to your library. You know you deserve it, you know, or maybe you buy it for someone for a Christmas present. And in the meantime, you can't wait to read it. So you open surreptitiously prize open the uh, wrapping paper and get your own little read of it in the middle of the night and then wrap it again. I won't tell anyone. Um, chapter eight is called Newgrange Womb of the Moon and examines the coincidence or the, uh, I suppose, the idea. Well, look, it's a coincidence that Brew Nabonia is from Brug Nabonia, the pa palace or mansion or abode of Boan or the palace of the Boyne. But also there's a, a word brew, which means womb. And of course, it has been pointed out by many, many, many scholars uh, that Newgrange is very uh, organic. Uh, it, is, uh, it is quite like a, um, a feminine structure. Uh, you know, a feminine reproductive system uh, and uh, all sorts of sort of interesting ideas thrown up by that. Um, Maria Gimbutas, of course, started that discussion by calling passage tombs passage wombs uh, and that uh, when you were placed in there, uh, you're, 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 you were placed in there not so much, uh, you know, uh, because you were dead and gone, uh, and this was your place of death, but perhaps this was also your place of rebirth. And a discussion of the importance of Venus, first pointed out, by the way, uh, by Joseph Campbell in the 1950s, uh, that there was, there was mythology suggesting, or folklore suggesting, that Venus shone in there. The dog star Sirius, which is important to the story of Newgrange, again, not going into too much detail, all conscious of the time. Chapter 9, Nouth, Secrets of the Sky. And without, again, going into too much detail, uh, myself at the time in, in the early 2000s, um, uh, quite a few of us alternative scholars were members of a, a Yahoo group uh, called Irish Stones. Now, there's a Facebook group called Irish Stones now, which initially was set up by Martin Byrne and uh, and several of us who were members of the old Irish Stones group were members of. But that new group is really not a, a patch on the old uh, Yahoo group because this, this was the day before social media. And these are the places where you hung out if you had sort of common interests. And there were a lot of very interesting people on there, the likes of Hank Harrison, uh, who was part of the uh, Brennan research team in the 80s, the likes of Martin Byrne, Victor Reich, uh, I think, ran it and, and set it up initially. Um, we also had Gillies McBain, who made seriously uh, incredible contributions, and uh, Charles Scribner, who was the one who taught me uh, about rotation of the nodes and eclipse prediction astronomy, the sort of stuff that none of the textbooks of modern astronomy teaches you, uh, but which is knowledge that was probably necessary and certainly uh, inherent in the mythology and inherent apparently in the layout of some of the sites. And so um, we looked at the apparent uh, alignment or misalignment 
of the two passages at Nauth, which were often said to be pointing east and west for the equinox, sunrise and sunset, but in fact were aligned several degrees off, in fact, in the case of the Western Passage, quite a way off uh, where you would see the sun setting uh, at the equinoxes. Uh, and uh, Scribner uh, proposed uh, a, a, a brilliant uh, astronomical um, interpretation of what was going on at Nauth, which involved the moon as much as it did the sun. So quite a lot of the scholars, even now in modern time, do not accept that the moon uh, was important to Neolithic culture and have a sort of a tendency to be a little bit dismissive about that. Uh, if you read my recent material uh, or you listened to the podcast that I shared about um, what is important about the equinox, why is Karen T apparently pointed towards the equinox? How do you determine equinox in the Neolithic and why would that be important? And in fact, what you find out is that it's not so much the equinox sunrise that's important. It's watching what the moon is doing in relation to that, uh, uh, co coincident with that uh, position. Uh, it's very important uh, to the rotation of the nodes and the prediction of eclipses. Again, something that the scholars are very sceptical about. It's the sort of thing that was initiated by Alexander Thom in the 1960s. Uh, and uh, there are some scholars uh, who seem... Uh, to have become um, <clears throat> determined to to uh, pull asunder the work of Tham and to disprove him. And there are those of us, of course, who follow uh, his work because, um, look, it never made sense to me as an astronomer uh, that in pre-calendar, in pre-clock, pre-modern times, uh, that you wouldn't factor the moon into your calendar. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, pretty much every uh, indigenous uh, uh, culture uh, that ever existed uh, um, made observations of the moon. And the moon entered not just their astronomy, but of course entered their language. And if you just look at Irish mythology and you look at the language around the moon, there are apparently seven, at least seven different words or phrases for the moon. Uh, if you examine certain passages of mythology, I think you see uh, the moon there described. Um, and it just never made sense to me that it, as a farmer in the Neolithic, that you would you would use a calendar based on the sun. And the sun has only two fixed points in the year, two hooks, as I call them, uh, where, where it stops rising and setting in the northeast and northwest at summer solstice. And then it's, it halts again on the horizon in, in midwinter. Uh, we call those the solstices, the sun standing still. It never made sense to me that a practical calendar that would involve just merely counting days between those. Absolutely, you would factor the moon into it. It appears from the work of Brennan, uh, which I tend to agree with largely, in, in, certainly in the case of Curbstone 52, the calendar stone at Nauth, it appears that there is a function there for, for working out the metonic uh, cycle of the moon. Uh, and it, it, it works very, very nicely in that regard. And there is a picture of the calendar stone. And you'll know that, uh, or you might have seen, you will see, you won't have seen it yet because you haven't got it yet. But those of you who have the older editions and who have also ordered the new edition will see that that's one of the changes that was made, that there's a new picture of the calendar stone on the bottom of page 195. So there's the 2020 edition. And there is the... First edition. Two different pictures. There you go. Subtle, subtle things. Um, uh, chapter 10 was called Cosmic Grid Lines Across the Landscape, which examined long distance alignments of sites, including the Patrick alignment, which is undoubtedly a, an earlier ne Neolithic pathway across the landscape uh, from. Uh, Drahada Millmount through Slain as far as Croke Patrick, and then the Bridget alignment, which again is undoubtedly pre Christian, linking Fohart and Kildare, two places intimately associated with St. Bridget, but passing through Slain and Tara and other important places on their way. Um, chapter 11 was called Star Stories Sky Myths of the Ancients. And um, 
the main tenet uh, of this chapter was that you can reread lots of Irish mythology uh, and see in it um, cloaked or concealed or sometimes not even very concealed language pertaining to the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, and the way they wander around the sky. Uh, and so I'll just give you one very, very explicit example of that, for instance, if I can find it here briefly. So we suggested that Cúchulán uh, might have been a depiction of Orion. And here we have in the Thoin, um, and I think this is where Lou um, has taken his place for three nights while he's healing. And he says to him, rise, mighty son of Ulster. Now that your wounds have been healed, a fair man facing your foes in the starlit ford of night. Uh, and I don't think that so much as a starlit ford on the ground as the very important starlit ford above Orion, where the sun and moon and the planets cross the river. And of course, Cucullin was very good at guarding fords and fighting in ford water, which is all very important. Anyway, uh, lots in there uh, in relation to uh, myths that can be, I think, um, uh, decoded uh, in astronomical terms. And the final chapter, which is the largest chapter of the book and the one with the most uh, copious footnotes. Uh, actually, I'll just tell you how many footnotes in chapter 12. Uh, uh, chapter 12 has over 200 footnotes. I know that. 219 footnotes. It's called The High Man, Return of the King, which I think was the, the alternative title we had suggested for the book in the first place. And that is all about the role of Orion and this giant uh, uh, man-like, warrior-like uh, image that we found, that uh, Richard found it actually, uh, in the maps of County Loud. Uh, I think uh, that deserves... A book of its own um and look a lot of those roads and features that outline that figure i think we did an episode about this you know they were they were built in the last few centuries it's just one of those things it's yet another fascinating series of coincidences around the fact that you've got the most eminent landscape in terms of monuments. You also have the most eminent landscape in mythological terms because this is the home of Cúchulán. It is Loud, named after Lú, the sun god. It is the location of the monuments of Brunabonia. You've got the Milesians arriving there. I mean, you just have everything in this area and it all links in with this great warrior-like uh, feature. And each of the dots with numbers on them are, are place names that are significant uh, to that. Um, so again, that might be sort of expanded out into its own uh, book at some stage. Uh, so I actually have all three editions here, which is a rarity. Uh, some of you have commented uh, the first editions. I'm not sure what the situation is going to be now that it's back in print, but certainly over the last eight or nine years, the first editions have commanded big money. So the first edition looked like this. And the main difference with the second edition was that there was a star which says revised and updated edition and also had the quote from Kenny's bookshop, which was a very nice quote about the book. On the back cover, things had changed slightly as well. It had gone from Amer a quote from Amergan, who but I knows the place where the sun sets, who but I knows the ages of the moon, what land is better than this island of the setting sun? And that was replaced with reviews of the book, very positive reviews which had been featured in various publications. And so just to compare then the second edition with the new 2020 edition, there have been changes, a few changes on the cover, and most notably a couple of the smaller images changed. The central image is now replaced with an image of Newgrange, this image of Douth replaced with this sunrise, and the one on the other side, uh, Maiden Tower at Mornington, now replaced by Leah Foyle at Tara. And then the back cover is different again. That's the second edition back cover with the reviews on it. And this is the new edition uh, with uh, fewer of the reviews and that picture, that solstice simulation picture from Newgrange with the triple spiral. So, uh, yeah, the other thing too I noticed, uh, was, it's very hard not to notice it, is that, you know, the, the new edition is bulkier um, 
it is slightly bigger uh, and it is uh, printed on, I think, slightly heavier paper, which gives it this lovely, lovely feel in the hand. Anyway, I'll read the uh, preface to the new edition to you. <clears throat> Hopefully you've enjoyed that uh, journey. Um, so uh, we are now 22, almost 22 years down uh, along the pathway from that in very interesting beginning in January 1999. And uh, myself and Richard are still good friends and we're still in regular communication, excited about the possibility um, of working together on another book. Because like um, when I collected this from our publisher, David Givens of the Liffey Press, one of the things he said was that was such a big book and it was so much work in it. And I said to him, and I meant it honestly, hand on heart, that in fact it could have been a lot bigger uh, because we really struggled to get all the information into one book and to do so in a way that wouldn't completely overwhelm the reader. And in fact, some of the feedback over the years from people has been, you know, there have been people who've told us, look, I, I dip in and out of it because I found it, I found it tough going especially if you don't know anything about astronomy or, for instance, if you don't know much about mythology, you're kind of catching up with everything. Uh, so um, I, I, I think there's definitely more work. Of course, I followed on with a book about Newgrange because I felt we could never have dealt with Newgrange sufficiently in two chapters of a book. And, and of course, it got its own book then with Newgrange Monument Immortality, and then I suppose Mythical Ireland, uh, New Light in the Ancient Past, which was published in 2017, would be what I would consider to be the closest thing to a follow-on to Ireland, an island of the settings on part two, if you wish. Um, but I've no doubt that if we're allowed, uh, if, 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 uh, if life allows us the time and the energy and the health and everything else, uh, Richard and I will produce another work together at some point uh, there's so much material. I mean, this is part of the uh, the essence of it, is there's so much material. Really, we didn't have to venture very far out of the Boyne Valley. We deal with Tara and Slane and Loch Crew, uh, but what we didn't do is we didn't incorporate uh, some of the other megalithic complexes, uh, like, you know, the stone circles of the south of the country, like uh, the mountaintop cairns of the Dublin Wicklow Mountains, uh, some of those in the north. Um, we didn't touch Sligo, uh, which, you know, let's let's face it, the whole Sligo complex deserves a book all of its own. And the, that if you did, you would just un, you would just be into a mammoth, a mammoth undertaking. There really is just so much, so much stuff. Now, some of it is a little bit, I know, I, I would say again, just to reiterate, I would say that we, it would be considered alternative uh, to a de degree. There's probably a few individuals who think it's fringe, there's probably one or two who think it's pseudo. I don't really care what people say, so long as that they enjoy it and that they feel it makes some contribution, uh, which is something that Ronald Hutton uh, praised us for uh, when he was writing about alternative works. He felt that ours stood out uh, because we weren't paranoid about archaeologists and uh, academics in general, uh, and that, in fact, we argued in favor of their evidence uh, and that uh, although we may have looked at alternative ideas uh, like the high man, for instance, um, you know, and yeah, on, inevitably there's a little bit of spirituality in there um, that it was offered up as a contribution to the overall debate. Some of you are hearing Coda. Uh, he's out in the yard and he's barking. He's probably... Uh, uh, defending his his territory, uh, I would love to be able to immediately share with you uh, what Ronald Hutton said, but I'm not sure that I I'm not sure where I have it saved. If I can find it quickly, I will read it because actually I think it's really nice. Um, I know um, Richard had sent it to me a good while ago, and it's not possible to quickly search through. Um, Facebook Messenger, I don't think. Anyway, I might share that on the group, uh, on the page uh, and the community page uh, later on uh, because he, he 
he didn't he was not disparaging about it at all um it seemed that he he valued it for um its honesty you know that we know we know that uh, we're not scientists and we are not the archaeologists and we're not the ones who dig the holes in the ground and collect the datable material and the hard data. Uh, but we were just interpreting all of that. So anyway, I'll read the preface to the 2020 edition, which will hopefully whet your appetite uh, for the whole thing. The nor oh, sorry, that's the acknowledgements. No, we're not going to read the acknowledgements. When Richard and Moore, when Richard and Moore, start again, Anthony, take a breath. When Richard Moore and I met in January of the year 1999 to begin our research into the myths and monuments of the Boyne Valley region, we could not have known the enormous harvest our collaboration would produce. We were excited from the very beginning. The material we read and the ancient monuments we visited seemed to yield something that did not conform to categories of conventional academic research. There was a cosmic, even otherworldly, ethereal dimension to it all, such that only a particular way of writing or a certain style of photography or artwork could capture it. Our early published work, much of it on the Mythical Ireland website, drew enthusiastic and encouraging feedback. The public was telling us there was something captivating and enchanting about the way we were combining disciplines such as archaeology, astronomy and mythology, among others. Plans for a book were discussed early on. It was a natural and logical path, particularly given my journalistic profession. We, we would write and illustrate through our art and photography a book chronicling our journey. The book and a title for it were a while coming. But by mid-2005, we had sufficient material for a comprehensive tome, though I was shrouded in doubt. Should I write it as a chronological record of our journey, or should I compose it to a geographic plan, starting, for instance, at the source of the River Boyne and following the course of the river in the other direction? As things transpired, I was able to do both to a large degree. Then progress was disrupted by a dispute among archaeologists about the provenance of certain features at the Douth Henge. This difference of opinion cast some doubt on our theory about the astronomical orientation of these features, and so the book got stuck so as not to contradict the views of experts. However, an exceptional series of coincidences brought a renowned expert on the matter into our company on the day of the summer solstice in 2005. Thus, through extraordinary synchronicity, the book could be completed. I started writing in the winter of that year, and by early 2006, I had sufficient material and an attractive and colourful proposal drawn up to allow me to seek out a publisher. David Givens of the Liffey Press was the first to respond, and with assuring alacrity, we agreed to meet. Richard and I had proposed two titles for the book, our preference and David's, was for Island of the Setting Sun, a title drawn from the words of the astronomer poet Amergin as he set foot on the shore of the River Boyne in prehistory. The book was sent to the printer and after weeks of waiting, the first copy was delivered into my hands by Liffey Press editor Brian Langan on 1st of December. So actually it's la even later than I thought, uh, 1st of December 2006. The rest, as they say, is history, or in our case, prehistory. The book became something of a cult hit and the first printing sold out in a year. A revised, expanded second edition came out in 2008. When it sold out and with no sign of a further reprint, second-hand copies commanded a premium price. Remarkably, first editions were being valued at $500 and, and as time went on, could be seen with price tags of several thousand dollars. We are grateful to David Givens for finally agreeing to publish a 2020 edition of the book. This is not a reworking of the book by any means, but slight adjustments and emendations have been made to the text to help improve its readability and to correct minor errors. Because yes, we are human after all, and we do make mistakes. We had no wish to interfere with the content other than those for those reasons. In the cold light of day, it can be said that the book was created with great enthusiasm by two people invigorated by the mysteries of myth and monument by stars, stones and stories. 
It might not survive the rigors of academic scrutiny, but it was never intended as such, instead appealing to a general audience for whom fairly obscure material is now readily accessible. Many things have been said and written about Island of the Setting Sun, most of them favourable. The book may have been tinged with a dollop of naivety, but our profound respect for the work of archaeologists and other specialists meant that the book was accepted for what it was, a contribution to the debate and understanding of Ireland's past, with some speculation included. We hope that you enjoy it, notwithstanding any imperfections, and that you find it follows the trail of ancient mysteries with all due probity, zeal and sincerity. Most of all, we hope that it engenders in you a passion for ancient Ireland and a yearning to know more, as it has done for us. And that is signed Anthony Murphy and Richard Moore, Drahada, July 2020. So there you go. It was the last thing that was done before it was sent off. Uh, to the printer. Here we have Ronald Hutton's comments. So just very briefly before we finish. Um, so he was talking about, and this is a, in his book, Pagan Britain. Uh, he appears to be talking about, um, uh, you know, alternative works. Uh, so for instance, the previous paragraph, this caused him to condemn archaeologists in general as being stuck in the past, it does not help the cause of alternative archaeoastronomy in the world of professional archaeology that its practitioners seem to disagree with each other while being equally hostile to mainstream scholarship if it does not give in to their demands. The last category presents a different sort of exception to the rule. It is represented here by two works. One, a lengthy study of the developed passage graves of the Boyne Valley, which appeared in 2006. The authors are Anthony Murphy and Richard Moore, a journalist and an artist from that district. In many ways, it makes a fit with the other case studies offered here. Its inspiring figure is, again, Thom. Well, I don't know why anyone ha would have a difficulty with the inspiration of Thom. He was a fabulous scholar, and I still think he's right about most of the things he said. And it proposes, after his manner, a large number of alignments between the various monuments and the sun, moon and stars. It is also rooted firmly in the earth mysteries tradition, drawing straight lines on the ground between the sites and finding a giant figure picked out in the landscape. Likewise, it treats the ancient world as having wisdom to teach the present. Yeah, <clears throat> read Jung and read Campbell and read uh, Mir Mircea Iliadi. Etc., etc., etc. It also, like Heath, I think he's referring to Robin Heath, but I could be mistaken, places an emphasis on medieval legends as supporting evidence for its claims. And we discussed that earlier about doubt. Uh, these are not medieval legends, they're legends that were written down in medieval times. That doesn't make them medieval. What is so unusual about it is that the authors have made every effort to understand archaeologists, to incorporate their findings and so show respect for them. They never, in fact, abuse any opponents, and their work is proportionately free of evangelical rhetoric. Instead, they admit that their arguments are speculative and offer them as a contribution to a general debate. And I actually really, really enjoyed those comments from Ronald Hutton because I felt he, he got it. He got it. Yes, it's alternative. Uh, yes, it's it's not it's not uh, it's not the sort of thing that would 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 pass uh, uh, academic rigor, uh, but uh, it it uh, I think it it makes a significant offering. Anyway, uh, all that remains for me to say at this point is, uh, apart from the fact that we'll be back next week, uh, we may come back to trees. I know there's lots and lots of different topics to be discussed. Uh, is to say that if you haven't. Um, got the book uh, and you haven't yet ordered a copy uh, I'm just pasting the link in right now where you can do so and uh, all of the copies uh, by turn you should see the remainders of the copies uh, they're all signed by myself and Richard so you'll get a, a copy in the post signed by both authors um, is there anything else that I need to say? Yes, just watch out over the next day or two for the calendar. I will share the cover image of the calendar and then a link as to where you can pre-order it. Uh, it'll be printed hopefully in the next couple of weeks, in the next two or three weeks, all going well. Uh, also, uh, not to forget, uh, uh, 
uh, patron, uh, Patreon, if you want uh, to become a patron. That's patreon.com forward slash mythical Ireland. In the meantime, I think it's my duty, as always, to say, please do your best to stay safe and well. Um, keep maintaining your vigilance with regards to COVID-19. Uh, cover your face with a mask, your nose and your mouth if you're going to be on public transport in a sh shopping centre or around crowds of people. Um, <clears throat> do wash your hands often. Do use hand sanitizer. Sneeze into the crease of your elbow. Uh, just do your best not to spread your germs. And stay safe <clears throat> and stay, stay well and come back to us and keep coming back to us. Uh, we're heading into the fall <clears throat> and into the inevitably into the winter. It would be really lovely uh, if we could continue uh, to uh, uh, to facilitate this space uh, for people, this virtual space where we've had so much enjoyment and so much interaction. I'm Anthony Murphy. That's all I have to say now. My uh, throat is getting dry because I've spoken far too long. We're an hour and three quarters into the, but uh, I, there was quite a, a, a long opening with hellos, which is a great complaint. Lovely to see you all. Uh, and I'm sorry if I missed anyone. I hope I didn't miss anyone or any comments. I'll try and catch up afterwards if I did miss any. Um, so take it handy. 7-3, as we say in ham radio terminology. Or in Irish, <coughs> we might say Slán agus Bánacht, Ichawa, good night, Kolosov, sound sleep. And of course, uh, Tóg go buge, take it easy. And Slán go foil. Bye for now. And hopefully it won't be too long. I'll try and do uh, an impromptu live stream or two in the coming week before next week's episode. Thanks a million, everyone. Hope you enjoyed yourselves. Good night. Slán.